heel as a team, we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen, believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back, way back, way back, way back. into the light. Into the light. Into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell, one inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's just game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean. One half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning and losing. Between living and dying. I'll tell you this, in any fight, it's the guy who's willing to die Who's gonna win that inch? And I know if I'm gonna have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that inch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You gotta look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're gonna see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're gonna do the same for him. That's a team, gentlemen. And either we heal now as a team, or we will die as individual, 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 individual. Ideas are bulletproof. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It is Sunday, November 6, 2011. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. Today, I am joined by some special guests, and I'm excited because uh, usually my shows are uh, uncovering the nasty side of things, and today is going to be a little lighter. It's actually going to be about solutions which a lot of the listeners like to learn about. And my guests today uh, have actually done it themselves. They've gone from city living to uh, sustainable living uh, in the countryside. And I couldn't think of two better people to bring on and explain and talk and just go over this stuff. And hopefully you guys will uh, gleam some sort of knowledge from this. So get your pads and your pens out. Make sure you... uh, Check the archive for the, the stream and pay attention today because today's show is going to be good. Now, I, I want to introduce you to them, but I, I want to I cover something really quick. Their names are not made up. Their names are real, okay? And I have no control over their names. So it's, it's, it's going to sound funny when you hear me introduce their names because it's Popeye introducing two other people that, you know, they are cart. They sound like uh, people are going to might relate to them and say, oh, it sounds like fake names, but they're not. Okay. So it just so happens that that's the way it is. Sorry, but that's the way life is sometimes, you know. Anyway, I'd like to introduce Natasha and Boris. Say hello, guys. Hey, what's up, Popeye? How's it going? And you guys are writing a book. Before I forget, you guys are writing a book about all this, correct? Yeah, we're writing, okay. um, it's, it's about the New World Order, the, the first book, because we're trying to keep it not too big, and then the second book will be uh, about the stuff we're talking about tonight. Okay. Um, do you guys have a working title for it yet, or no? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, that's not a big deal. So I know that most of the time authors don't come out with the title until sometimes right beforehand anyway. So um, I want to get right into it. You, Natasha, used to live down here in uh, Florida and in uh, South Florida in particular in a very uh, city-esque, busy area down here. And now you live a rather rural life with chickens and, and goats and the such. How much of a um, culture shock was it for you, and how were you able to get over it so that the listeners can gleam some knowledge so that maybe they can use you know, the tips that you have maybe to get through it? How did you get through the culture shock of going from the city to the countryside like that? Um, I dealt with it pretty well. I, I was pretty sick of South Florida. I pretty, I, I hated living in the concrete jungle. I, before I moved, I, uh, I didn't want to like leave my house because I was just, <laughs> I was just like so over it. But, um, so I actually transitioned pretty well. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of work, but it's, it's definitely worth it. Definitely. When, about, when you guys... When you guys mm-hmm. went out there, was it, um, you know, like obviously you were in the mood to get out. Uh, how, it, uh, give the listeners an idea kind of of um, what's a good way, like you when you got out there, what, before you guys went, obviously there were, you guys didn't just run out there with nothing. Um, uh, you know, you figured at least a plan of action out in, until you got out there. Was it that hard? I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's so difficult to, to alter your life and stuff like that. Did you find that it really wasn't that hard to do it and, and alter your life? No, I don't, I don't think it was hard. I think it was uh, interesting and fun so far um, going from you know, living in a place where there's 100,000 people and then going out to a place where there's 2,000 people, I think, that is now out here. So it's, it's peaceful. See, that's, that's, I know the difference. I've seen both ends. And uh, I, I, I think it's uh, an awesome juxtaposition. But I, I, I guess if you're ready to do it, it's probably uh, much, much easier. Now you guys have your own goats and chickens and everything. You guys even shoot on your own property. The 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 county or the city that you guys live in, they don't mess with you? No. The uh the place where we're living, the people before were shooting and the neighbors didn't like it. So they called the police and the police came by and asked, you know, what the problem was. They said they're making a racket back there shooting, they're like, Oh, okay, uh, what's the problem? They're like, Well, we want you to make them stop. So they ended up going back there and shooting with the people who were you know, shooting, pretty much telling the, the neighbors that there's nothing they could do about it. They're on their own land. Yeah. The, <laughs> so the cops ended up shooting with the people that were shooting there. Yep. <laughs> that's the way it should be. Exactly. You see, that's the way it's supposed to be. So good. There are some pockets of this country that are still the way they're supposed to be. Because, you know, and of course, there was, of course, the figures you guys had to have the, the neighbor. Oh, wah, 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 You know, and so, somebody in the chat room said, Popeye sounds like a city boy. No, I, I grew up in the verge between the city and the, the country, and I've experienced both. But I'm used to the city. And uh, in a lot of places, even, uh, e- e- even rural areas, a lot of the sheriffs and local cops are now being dicks and cracking down on people that you know even shoot on their own property. So it is still nice to see that there are pockets of of you know this country that still have things the way they should be. It's nice to see that you know total tyranny hasn't taken place. I do like to uh, I like to see that uh, people can exercise their Second Amendment. You know, I grew up around guns. I grew up hunting and stuff, but. Uh, uh, everywhere I've ever lived and, and most places I've seen, and I have friends that even you know, live out in rural areas, you can't shoot on your property anymore because for one reason or another, they, you know, they, they try to find some reason to demonize you. And again, like you, 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 like you guys stated, the neighbor was being some nanny, you know, wimpy, whiny, oh, you, they're shooting guns and making noise, make them stop. And the cop's like, 
we yeah. can't do anything. You know, that's that's good. I'm glad that it's still like that. I'm glad this country hasn't gone that far down the tubes yet. So that gives me there a little were, hope. They were city folk, as they put them. The, the ones that were complaining were from the city, so it was funny because all the country people were laughing at them because they're just like, look at these city folk. <laughs> Well, it's funny, you know, when you come from a city, when, like when you when you've been in the city for a while, you get it's amazing that what you even when you know things exist, it's a you see things that should be the norm, and you're like, wow, it's so nice to be able to be normal. <laughs> it, it, it's really strange. It, it, that's how that's where the world is going to nowadays. All right, guys, we're gonna get cut off by the break, so stay there, listeners. Stay tuned. We'll be right back more solutions on the other side. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm hanging out with Boris and Natasha, who were urbanites. They lived in the city. Now they are living out in the country and very sustainably, I may add, real sustainable living. Not this fake, you know, green, fake, you know, agenda crap, but real, actual, sustainable living. And uh, I, the first thing I wanted to get into with them was. Uh, the whole how do you get the farm thing because not many people have money and Natasha was explaining to me uh, that there's a, a lot of people that are actually uh, like almost financing to buy uh, you know rather than pay rent you're you know you pay the the monthly rent but it's you know you're, you're literally paying the property off while you live on it so I wanted to get into that a little bit because not many people know about it I'm not really an expert on it and Natasha herself does know, uh, you know, a decent amount about it. So, uh, Natasha, how uh, do people go about this, and what exactly is the process? Well, pretty much, it's up to you as to well, what do you want to do? Do you want a homestead, uh, whereas you you want to bring in as little as possible from the outside world, and you want to provide everything for yourself? That would be a homestead. Um, you might decide that maybe a homestead isn't for you. You want to buy things in the store still, but you want to be able to provide your own milk. So you want some dairy goats and maybe you want a couple eggs. So you want some chicken. Um, it's, it's really up to you what, what you want to do. Um, as far as finding land, once you decide what it is that you want, then you can buy the amount of land in the house that would cater to whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, you know, you might want to have the land so you can do some kind of, uh, business so you can make money uh, while you're there with this land. Um, you, you could maybe do something from home or you work from home, um, and you have the land as a supplemental income. Um, so... Well, how uh, oh, you were telling me that some people were financing it, right? There's a lot of people that don't even want to deal with the banks anymore because of yeah. they, they don't, their distrust for the banks, and it's actually starting to go back to the way things used to be, you know, in the older days. Uh, so basically, correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of these people are they're selling their farms and stuff or whatever or their properties, but rather than go through the bank. They, you know, work out a deal, uh, you know, a contract, obviously, uh, on paper, but uh, a better one, nonetheless, because the banks aren't involved. And basically, you'd be uh, paying off the owner of the property monthly, like you were paying rent, but you'd literally be paying off the uh, the, the monthly mortgage payment, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And a lot of owners are doing that, you said, Correct. Yeah, a lot of people are doing that, especially out here. Um, people want to get rid of their houses, so they're providing owner finance. And um, so that's what it's called, owner financing. Mm-hmm. Okay, exactly. I couldn't remember the name of it, but I I knew it was called something. Um, is is there uh, uh, you know once you get the okay once you get the place and everything, how 
how hard is it to maintain the chickens and the goats? I mean, uh, realistically, because people are going to ask this question. So, I mean, is it is it expensive, you know, monthly with the feed? Is it a real pain in the rear end? Or how much effort does it take to actually do this? Because some people are going to be, well, I have to work or I have to do this or I have to do that. So you both have jobs. So how how do you find time or is there – does it take, you know, a bunch of your time? How do you fit it into your schedule with everything and still, you know, working like, you know, to, you know, like normal like most people where you, you both have jobs? How do you fit it in? Well, <clears throat> depending on what size of an operation you want to go for, the chickens are relatively easy and low-maintenance. As long as you have a good shelter for them to go in at night, you know, we let them run free pretty much throughout the whole property all day. And when the sun starts to go down, they just jump right, you know, into their spot where they're supposed to be. Uh, Feed-wise, they get most of their food outside, grass and bugs and worms and whatnot. Um, With the goats, it's a, you know, we have them... At first, in an electric fence to get them used to the property, and then we let them out into the larger part of the pasture, which is about five acres. So they have, you know, all their room to run. They love trees and branches and stuff like that, what they can reach better than, say, grass. So they take care of that stuff first. They're like weed eaters. So you just let them go, and they'll clear out a spot for you in no time. So That's they take cool. care of their own team pretty much. You have your own landscaping crew. Yes, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. They they can clear out an area really fast. I mean, and at the same time, they're fertilizing the ground. So when you want to plant later, it's you know fertilized for you. If you had some pigs, you can put the pigs in there and they'll till it for you. It's 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 about making it so you don't have to do as much of the work. They're doing the work for you. Um, we give them some grain. Uh, but we're doing it less and less as they get older. When they're young, you kind of have to give them some brain. But as they get older, they're uh, less expensive to keep. So, so. When, when you guys are feeding them, obviously it doesn't even – you don't even have to worry about feeding them half the time because they're just – you know, chilling out and roaming around the yard at any time of the day. And if they're hungry, they'll nibble on something and it kind of helps yeah. you with the landscaping. So that, that actually, that's, that is very sustainable there. You're taking care of the landscaping. You don't have to worry about, you know, the grass clippings or anything. And you're actually uh, recycling it, I guess you could say. Yeah. And then the, you guys get milk from the goats, right? Yeah, we, we actually, we haven't started milking them yet. Um, we're in the process of building a milk stand. <laughs> it's, it's important to have everything ready beforehand. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but also uh, one of them, well, they have to get used to you also. It's not like you just get the goat and they're like, here, let me, <laughs> let me milk you if they're not used to being milked. These goats are not, so we're kind of, um, you know, training them to be used to us and letting us, you know, pet them and clip their, uh, you have to trim their hooves every once in a while and stuff like that. And then, you know, gradually then you work yourself into, you know, getting intimate with them and milking them. <laughs> I got you. So you got to kind of, you got, you kind of got to get the goat used to you touching it and everything else. And then used to the surrounding area, I guess you can kind of alleviate the stress on the animal. So it gets used to everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That makes, that makes sense. Well, uh, when it comes to the chickens, how, um, you know, is it, is it really a big process to have a chicken coop and everything else? Is it a, like cleaning up and maintaining, I guess not, you don't clean the chickens, but like cleaning up after them, basically. Um, I guess if you have a proper chicken coop, it's, it's probably built to, to make that efficient or whatever, but, uh, that I guess doesn't take too much time either, and I, I guess you could pretty much just put some water in their their little water trough or whatever, and put feed down once a day or whatever, and they're good to go, right? Yeah, pretty much. We had a building. We have several buildings that were here when we moved onto the property, and uh, we just used you know what was there and built onto it. So they have a you know a two gallon water and a two gallon feeder that just sits in their coop, and they eat that at night you know, or whenever they're around. And then as far as cleaning up, we just rake up the hay that's, you know, 
the floor and put it underneath that. And then that goes in the compost. So it's all used. So it's all sustainable and it all ends up being composted and then used for you know, growing mm-hmm. plants and gardening. Wow, let's see. That's that. That's that's real sustainable living. That's the way to do it. Cut down on your on your waste. Your real carbon footprint. I hate that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I hope you're taking notes because it's a lot easier than I thought so far. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're talking sustainable living. In the last segment, uh, Natasha and Boris were explaining to everybody exactly how easy it is to uh, to live sustainably. And uh, I myself was actually surprised just listening to them how it's not really that much effort. I mean, obviously they had to build up the chicken coops and stuff, but... Uh, like Boris was saying, they had some some structures on the property. He fixed them up, and turned them into the chicken coops, and running it. Once you get everything up and running, it doesn't even sound like it takes that much maintenance. In fact, having a goat apparently is like having a lawnmower with feet. So, you know, that sounds like it's a good thing. Uh, you guys grow your own food on the property? Yeah, right. Right now we don't have. Well, we have some tomato plants that kind of uh, got a little bit of the freeze, but we're going to try to salvage them. We're building a uh, hoop house. Actually, we're, we were working on it today, and we're going to plant some veggies so we have stuff to do the fall and the winter. Well, that's cool. And you guys, you guys can can your own stuff and do all that. You yeah, we got wood stove? supply. You guys have a wood stove or a fireplace. Uh, we actually do have a wood stove out in the uh, tool shop area, and um, we have some kerosene heaters that we use for heat. And uh, we're going to get a new wood stove for the living room. We just haven't gotten one yet. We'll wait till the uh, kerosene runs out. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. So, but we have plenty of wood. You both lived in cities and stuff before. Do you find that your life is just more pleasurable and pleasant? And I don't want maybe pleasurable is the wrong word. Um, like you feel better health wise. Just everything is. Do you feel that everything is? Uh, I mean, obviously it's a change. So do you do you feel that inside and out it's a change for the better from where you are? Yeah, I mean, I was in working in the computer industry, and uh, it's. It's just very stressful. Um, I still work in the computer field, but it's just <laughs> it's less stressful when you're not in, trapped in an office and having to commute and uh, and just having your own piece of you know it's yours. You can go out there, you can shoot, you can your animals are running around. It's, it's there's just something about it, something tangible about it that you, something that you can call your own. You know, even if it's just like. A, you know, a, a little plot of land, something that you could just put a garden or something. But um, it's it does something to your to your mind. Definitely something mentally, something it calms you down. Um, it I was just really stressed out, and after moving here, I'm I'm, I'm doing a lot better. I still stay busy, still doing a lot of stuff, but it's um, you don't dread getting up in the morning having to mm-hmm. go on with your life and do this thing. You have more options when, when you're, it's just kind of a total life change. We came out here and, and, you know, I started doing freelance computer work instead of going in nine to five at a computer job. Um, he started doing pretty much freelance carpentry. He's a carpenter, started putting ads on Craigslist. Um, and we've been doing Luckily, uh, we've been doing really well. Just took a chance. Our mortgage is really low. Uh, we got rid of one of our cars because you know I work from home, and you know he commutes, so he uses the other car. It's paid off. Um, I, I would suggest to people to to start cutting your your bills little by little. Mm-hmm. That's what we did. Little by little, uh, pay off that credit card. Little by little, get rid of that uh, cell phone. Maybe cut down your minutes. Make your income more than your outgoing. Mm-hmm. 
And just yeah, about I've been, I've been thinking myself night. about turning my cell phone off. It's funny that you say that because I pay uh, an exorbitant amount of money each month for my cell phone, and I'm just tired of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm tired of my. I mean, it's it's convenient to have access to my email and stuff, you know, when I'm on the road. But honestly, I'm not on the road that much, and I really don't need to be paying what I pay per month for my cell phone. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I could get a little flip phone with unlimited phone minutes and then you know just turn the computer crap off of the phone and you know just walk around with the uh the regular cell phone and that's it i I don't need to have the the smartphone because i have it right now and i really it's getting to the point where i don't want to pay for it anymore and i'm tired of it i'm over it i used to be one of these people that when a new phone came out i'd be like i I didn't go out and buy it but i would at least be like oh let me check it out and see oh that's cool options and stuff and you know now i don't even care and yeah. it's been like that for a couple of years. I just, I've lost my, I could care less about cell phones anymore. My the smartphone I have is two years old. You know, they've come out with newer versions of it since I, I don't care. I'm about ready just to chuck it off a balcony and get rid of it and just get a little flip phone or something. There you if go. That. Cause I don't have a landline. So I would have to use the, the, the flip phone or whatever, but it, I would have no choice, uh, you know, but to use it. But I need some sort of line, uh, like phone line, to make phone calls and stuff from. But I don't need to be. I mean, yeah, I use the GPS on it a lot. But uh, I mean, honestly, could could I could I go back to using a map like I used to back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a bit more of a pain in the butt. But do I really need to be paying what I pay for? Do I want to pay, you know, a monthly bill to have somebody track me on my on my friggin' phone and figure, you know, if they want to, the 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 company's like, here, this is where he's gone in the past month or whatever. You know, I if I do it with a map and a pencil and a piece of paper, you know, it's it, you'd have to literally put a tracking device on me or something to be able to figure that stuff out. So. It, it makes it harder for them, and why do I want to pay you know 120 bucks or whatever it is I pay I, you know with tax or whatever per month for my my phone line? It's ridiculous, you know. Oh well, you're paying for the internet and you have this special hookup fee because of your phone. And well, you know what? Maybe I'm tired of my phone, you know. And it's getting mm-hmm. to that point, you know. I'm I'm about at that point. I mean, yeah, it's got conveniences. I can take pictures with it and send pictures to my wife or. You know, if my mother-in-law wants to see a picture of something, but like I can't just like I can't do that with a camera. Keep a camera on me, and then you know, just do it the old-fashioned way, I guess you would say, and do it through the computer and email. You know, I mean, how funny is it that emailing a photo is now kind of old-fashioned? It's easier to do it with your cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and like you guys, you guys went back out to the country and cut things out. And look, you guys didn't die. The world didn't end, you know. <laughs> it is possible to do. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It's very possible to do. That's why I'm excited to have you guys on because it's like you guys are living proof that it can be done and that, you know, you know, it's like having an ex-smoker on and saying, look, you can quit. It's okay. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> You know, you guys can quit the city. You can move out to the country and become sustainable, and it, it is possible. So that's awesome. Uh, was it expensive to get the chickens and the goats and all that stuff? Um, it, it wasn't too bad. It's you just don't try to do everything at once. I think that would be the the main uh, suggestion. Do it little by little. We started out with chickens. We we're like, you know what, chickens. We read about it. It's pretty easy. Let's get some chickens. So we got some chickens, and we're like, hey, this isn't too bad. When they're chicks, they take a little more work because, you know, you have to make sure that they have food and water and all that. But, you know, once they get a little bigger, it's definitely a lot easier. They, they take care of themselves. I guess you don't have to worry about cleaning them or, or you know, anything like that. So that's awesome. Do you guys have, uh, you guys have chickens and goats? you guys have pigs yet? No, we have uh, a calf, a uh, four-month-old, I mean, a four-week-old, sorry, uh, brown Angus calf. Um, mm, that's going to be good steak gave, with it. Somebody gave her to us because she was born out of season, and uh, our neighbor, the the, uh, the neighbor had the mother, and the mother did, wasn't producing enough milk, so she called us up and was like, well, you want her? We, we can't 
take care of her. We don't have time. We're like, sure, give her to us. Free cow, sure. <laughs> Free. We got the room, so. Well, if you guys ever needed to, you could always eat her, but now you don't want to eat her because you kind of feel bad for the cow. So now you just got to give her a home, and that way you get free milk. Mm-hmm. So, so and free. Can... Well, you never know. I mean, like, I, if, if all hell breaks loose, you could always, you know, that feeling of, oh, poor cow might go away, and then you have steak and hamburgers for a couple of weeks. So that's that, that's good, too. But uh, it, it's cool because now the cow will produce milk and manure, which you could turn around and use as fertilizer for uh, plants and stuff for your garden. And I got to tell you, if there's one thing that plants love, it's manure. It, you know, Because yeah. the cow manure is full of nitrogen, so it sucks all that right out of it and just eats it. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, the, the plants are like super plants. So I, my mother used to have gardens where, where we, we had... We made her gardens uh, in, in her backyard in Jersey, and she she taught me all this stuff. And so uh, it's interesting. It's really interesting. But that's why I'm, I'm I'm glad I got you guys on. Stay there. We're going to break. We'll be back. More sustainable living. We still got hour number two. Don't go. Anywhere. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Sustainable living, sustainable living, sustainable living. Very important. Very, very important. <laughs> Natasha, let me ask you this. When you guys first started, did you think it was going to be so easy? Were you kind of nervous that it was going to be overwhelming? Was it more, is it, I, mean, it, I guess, is it easier to do than you thought it was going to be? Some things have been easier. Some things I I honestly had no idea. Um, when, I'll tell you, you know, it hasn't all been all been really easy. Not as easy as the chickens. When we first got our goats, we got a male and a female goat, and uh, the male goat was determined to get out, and you know, he was going to get out, and he wanted to find more female goats. I think because it was the breeding season, and he started running down the road. I mean, there's traffic. He's running down the road. And I'm chasing him with the female goat in tow behind me, trying to get his attention to come back. Because <laughs> I thought he was going to just run into the woods and just run away. <laughs> so finally, finally, I'm like, all right, I'm going to stop running away from this goat. And I just looked at him and he looked at me. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm a person. I can outsmart this goat, okay? I turned around. I started walking the other day, other way. And he's looking at me like, hey, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going back home. <laughs> he kept walking, and he just starts running after me. And he came back to the house, and after that, we tied him up and put him back on Craigslist and sold him in like 15 minutes. <laughs> wow! So you can sell you can sell goats. You can sell goats that fast down there, huh? On Craigslist. Yeah. Well, we put him. We bought him for like 20 bucks, and we put him up for 15 bucks. So I mean, it's pretty cheap. <laughs> The, it, the animals aren't really expensive, not if you don't want, like, bloodline animals, you know? If you're just starting out, you can get kind of, like, not the top notch, but just so you can get your feet wet. And then um, the, the problem is, where are you going to put them? How are you going to keep them? You know, that's what you have to have. And and, and that so you have to have some place, like, to keep a roof over them so they don't get wet and stuff? Yeah. I mean, don't take water. Yeah, goats, they need shelter. They don't like water. But All right, so they, they need shelter and then obviously uh, just enough, you know, long unmowed grass for them to walk around and eat. <laughs> <laughs> so you need like at least an acre or two of property, I would say, to have a goat or two so that they can, you know, comfortably graze and eat and do their thing or do you like two goats per acre? Like, is there like a... Um, a uh, some sort of mathematical solution to figure it out, or you just kind of wing it. It depends on. Um, it, you could put them on a quarter acre if you wanted. It's just they wouldn't have as much area to uh, graze on. You would probably want to rotate them, maybe a little bit on your pasture. You can have an electric fence, or you can have uh, what they have, uh, like cow panels. That's uh, the people that we actually got our goats from. They had them in a smaller area. They were living in more in the city. 
and they had maybe like three or four goats in an area. And what they would do is just provide them with hay, um, maybe bring in some extra brush, give them grain, um, stuff like that. They're they're pretty easy. I mean, just keeping them in is hard. Yeah, it's what what was the saying about? Yeah, if if you can throw water through the fence, then you, the goat can get out. <laughs> Especially the males. When the females are in heat, they'll do anything and get out of any anywhere. That doesn't surprise me. It sounds like a dog. Uh, my uncle had my uncle had Doberman. That was the same way. Uh, it, do you guys? Let me ask you this. A lot of people would ask this as a question that's not asked, but I'm sure a lot of people think about it. Um, do the rural areas have internet access like the cities do? Like you both, you both, you know, know about how you know come from an area where there's, you know, in in, we'll say in South Florida, for example, if you were in a, a large city like Fort Lauderdale or Miami, you could just call your cable company up, and tell them you want the the, the the super high speed internet, the fastest one they have, and they come and they they install it for you. Uh, is is that capability out in in a lot of rural areas, or is it still dial up at best? Um, we have HughesNet, which is a satellite internet, and it's faster than dial-up, but it's not anywhere close to high speed. So that's pretty much a mile. A mile closer to town, though, is high-speed internet. So we're, you know, we're just outside of the line. <laughs> Where we are now, we're talking to you, is a couple miles from our house, and they have high-speed internet. So that's why we're here, and we're not at our house. <laughs> So I mean that's crazy that they. What's the big deal about running the lines out there? They, they literally don't have poles. I mean obviously there's power lines going out there, so that the poles are already there. They could just run the same lines out there, and half the time, it's underground. You know, that's why they run that fiber optic crap. So what's the deal? Did they give you guys a reason they just don't go out? I mean it almost seems like an effort to not bring out, you know, high speed internet access to rural areas. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't think there's a demand for it out here. People aren't asking for it enough. Oh, I guess that will that 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 would do it. I mean, I'm sure if the farmers don't care about internet, that would do it. It might not be enough people. Maybe they're not going to make enough money. Maybe there are more people. It ends pretty much where the uh, isn't it like the city? Yeah, the city. Where the city lines end is pretty much where the internet ends, and we're out in like the rural areas. In the county. In the yeah. county. So like we don't pay like city taxes. We only pay county taxes. That's, I mean, that's that's so awesome. And the only thing that sucks is if you're if you're internet based, your company, you know, then you got to figure something out. But I'm sure, uh, I I just can't imagine how the the company itself. You can't call whatever internet company and say, look, I want high speed internet. You know, is there a, a you know a fee for because we're out? You know, you you come out and you set up the line or whatever. It's just weird that you you know. I know it's not as hard as they make it sound. Uh, it, it's just you know they they have high speed internet you know they're they're trying to worry about putting it on trains and planes and everything else and then <laughs> there's still areas of the country that don't have it. I just it's funny how we try to outpace ourselves. Sometimes it makes you wonder if it's done on purpose, you know, because if they really wanted it out in the rural areas, the company would just put it out there and eventually the people would bite and like you know you'd get the kids of the farmer, hey dad, we can get online and maybe build a website and sell you know sell stuff online. Well, son, you're right. Wow, you know it's nice to have high speed internet access. Blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, even if the the, the, the I, I understand the whole thing about the need thing, and that's actually a really good point, Boris. Uh, but knowing these these companies, they would just you know, it's like throwing a fishing line in the water, and they'll just throw the line in the water and wait. So it kind of makes you wonder if they don't want people in the rural area to have access to the internet, and because everything is hooked to the internet, it's like a. Uh, a downside to living out there. You know what I mean? People don't want if they have kids, well, my kid has to get on the internet or I have to get it on the internet for work. You know, so something that would, um, uh, I guess you could say, um, not, not disable them, but uh, hinder them from doing their jobs, you know, or hinder them with their, you know, you know, cause they don't want to be real parents with their kids or whatever. And they just want to plop them in front of the internet and let them watch YouTube and everything else. Uh, well, exactly. That 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 really is like a downside for a lot of people. And I, I know that that's you know we might look at that thinking and be like, well, they should just be parents. But 
as a you know as these social engineers as they, the things they do it kind of makes you wonder if that's like how they stop people from going out there i guess is where i was going with that you know what i mean like hey there's no internet access out there you know what are you yeah. gonna do set up smoke signals ha 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 and people are like oh my god i can't get on facebook we can't live out here you know we can't have goats <laughs> that is is from from people moving out here that's a that's a good good point I think they're going to have internet out here eventually, though. I don't know if it'll be through them, but I know there is a big, uh, I know like the cell phone lines and everything, how you can go through the internet with your laptop. They want to have it so that you can get out in the rural areas. Since uh, cell phones are more available in the rural areas, they could just go that way and it'd probably be in the end cheaper than running lines out there. Well, I think that's probably one of the things that's happening, too, is people are getting smartphones that live uh-huh. out in these farms, and they just pay, you know, 130 bucks a month, and they have unlimited phone and, and Internet access and whatever else. And I'm sure a lot of these phones now, uh, I know Sprint, uh, I've seen the commercials, they have one of them, uh, one of their phones, they have an HTC phone that uh, you could turn it on and it becomes a wireless hotspot. I think it's for like six or eight. Uh, six or eight little computers or whatever. So obviously you're not going to be able to, you know, have a gaming on there. But you could go on and surf the web or or work online if you had to or whatever. So uh, I mean, a lot of these farmers probably do that. Uh, I think it would be better to have for everybody to have access to high speed internet. And it's not me being one of these, you know, putzes that you know, like in government, we must force high speed internet on everybody. I, I'm not trying to force it, but I think it's a tool. If everybody, if used in the right way, it's a tool for people to wake themselves up, educate themselves, and liberate themselves. That's just my personal opinion, and that's why they're going after the uh, internet. That's why they're demonizing it, trying to make it bad. That's why they're also demonizing people that do what you guys are doing and live sustainably and have chickens and goats. Well, you guys must be terrorists because you yeah. know you wanna you wanna have your own chicken that lays its own eggs. God forbid you you know Al Qaeda might come out of one of the eggs. You got to be careful, and your goat <laughs> your goat's name is Osama bin Laden, and you got to be careful because he's really a terrorist in disguise. It's just ridiculous, you know. That's why they're demonizing all this stuff. That's why it's important for people to learn about it and learn what really goes on and how easy it is, and you know, at least put the idea in their heads. Hopefully, that'll lead them down the track of at least looking into it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to the top of the hour break. We'll be back. In about six, seven minutes, so stay tuned. We're back with our next Ladies and gentlemen, we are back for hour number two. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye from FederalJack.com. I'm hanging out with my friends Boris and Natasha, who are now residing in Virginia, but they used to live in the big bad city. And now they're residing out somewhere in an undisclosed location in the countryside. And we were able to fix their microphone. So now I can hear her much better. And I can hear Boris much better. And you guys will be able to hear both of them much better. So that was a uh, a, a technical problem, which we, we, we seem to have overcome. Um, what would you guys say is a good place to start for somebody who's just getting into this. Where's a good place to start, you know, if, say, someone has an apartment, they haven't yet gotten a chance to move out into the countryside, but they want to at least start some some sort of uh, type of, you know, growing their own food or whatever, or, you know, they want to at least start to get into it. What would be a good starting point that you would recommend for someone that maybe doesn't have a big plot of land, but maybe they have a balcony or something that they can grow some plants? Um, I would definitely say to get started, if you have a balcony, uh, you can get an an herb garden going on. Um, Think about what things you use when you cook. The idea is for you to have to bring in less things into your house and you can provide for yourself. So, I mean, you can get some parsley going, some oregano, um, some basil, some garlic, um, you know, all those things that you tend to buy a lot of when you're cooking. At least I do. I cook a lot. So, you know, you can dry them. Um, 
you can get um, even some small, if you wanted to get some small quail, I don't know how big your balcony is, but the quail, they don't take that much room and you could have uh, maybe one or two female quail. Um, they lay an egg almost every day. Um, three quail egg equal about one chicken egg. And um, they're really hardy. Um, they don't eat a whole lot. And you can, if you breed them, you can eat uh, their young if you eat meat. Or if you only eat dairy, you can eat the eggs. And um, I would say that you start not only learning about how to uh, grow something in your garden, but also learn about how um, you need to plan if, uh, you know, something happens and you need to, you know, let's say a catastrophe happens. Um, you make sure that you have uh, storable food in addition to your balcony food. Uh, you have some kind of, you know, you can start buying in bulk, like uh, flour, uh, grain, um, start buying, um, you know, sugar, salt, things like that, like you see on sale, cans of food that maybe is uh, on sale four for a dollar. Just start buying it little by little and building up your pantry. Um, I think that's really important for people because, as you see, like you, you got these freak snowstorms. It doesn't even have to be the New World Order. Um, but I, I think that's important for people. Um, learn basic first aid, have a first aid kit, um, especially if you're out in a rural area. Um, it, or if you're in the city as well, it's good to have uh, so you are prepared. Um, get a ham radio, get a regular radio, even just a battery powered radio. If the internet goes out, like, you know, how are you going to know what's going on outside? There's no TV. You know how it is living in Florida. You know, I, I, I think that's important too, to, you know, get your balcony going and also little by little start preparing for, uh, for something. Cause I definitely think that something's coming down the pipes. You can feel it in your in your bones, right? Like something, something's oh, yeah. going to happen. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's going to be. But something is going to happen. And this is the same collective feeling that everybody had before 9-11. So they're up to something. Yeah. And get to know your neighbors, you know, because those are going to be the people that you're going to have to depend on. Um, you know, just with our experience with the hurricanes living in Florida, you know, everybody starts having to barbecue outside because everything's going to go bad in your fridge if you don't cook it. And you, exactly. you, know, that, you know, you you don't you can't you can't watch TV. All of a sudden, everybody's disconnected from the TV, and it's like, oh wow, that's what my neighbors look like. And <laughs> you know, and it was just so strange. Like you can't really go anywhere because you can't drive because you can't really get that much gas. You don't yeah, want down here. People TV were trading generous. candles and stuff for meat. Like you give me a hamburger, I'll give you a candle and stuff. And that, that's the way we were. Uh, uh, and that's the way it was working for like a week and a half, two weeks until everybody got their power back. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. there was there was there was more. The cops were probably causing more problems than anything down here because they were arresting everybody and everybody for being out past curfew. And it's amazing. They decided that there was going to be a curfew of mm. eight o'clock at night. And if you weren't in by eight o'clock at night, they were literally they arrested hundreds of people every night. And people would be like, this is the United States of America. What is it, Nazi Germany? I could walk around. And they're like, no, you're beyond curfew. Pepper spraying people, tasing people, whooping people's asses, all for just being out past 8 o'clock at night. You know, So it, it's amazing how fast these drones are willing to take away someone's civil liberties. That's why it was nice to see the, when you, you told that story the first hour about how the, the owners before you guys of uh, the, the house that – you guys bought that the uh, the neighbors called the cops for them shooting on their property because they were making noise, and the cops rolled up and said we can't do a thing, and it went down and shot with them. Exactly. You know, that, that's the way it's supposed to be. You know that that's the way it should be. It, so that's, right. uh, that's a perfect example of the way it should be. You're not supposed to have a cop be like, well, I'll go down there and take them guns because I don't care if it's their property or not. You know, I'm the law and I can do what I want because I think I know what's right. Now, that's that's not the way it works. You know, and it's good that those cops actually knew what they were, what the law was and that they they understood it and respected it. That's the other key thing. And, and they knew each other, so that's the whole thing about community as well. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. A, a, a good point, Boris. Everybody knows each other here too. 
Well, that's important. I mean, how are you supposed to survive if you don't know your neighbor? You know, the last thing you want to be doing is getting to know your neighbor, you know, after the fact. It's like I said, (laughs) uh, 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 we had a lot of people don't think about it, but it's like, you know, you really got to get to know your neighbors because you're going to have to depend on each other. In a scenario scenario where you wouldn't want someone breaking onto your property, stealing what you have. Instead, you get to know everybody so that doesn't happen. So nobody has to steal from yeah, and then they'll protect your property too hey who the hell are you what are you doing on you know uh, what are you doing on bob's property you get the hell off there you don't belong on there you know or or whatever you know i mean that's the way it works that's the way you want you want your you want to be a working cohesive unit you want your there's no reason you should fear your neighbor the government wants you to fear your neighbor they want you to think that, you know, your neighbor is Osama bin Laden, you know, and oh my god, he's going to come get you. He's a he's a terrorist, damn it. He's a terrorist because he grows his own food. He's a terrorist. It's retarded. You know, my friends busted my balls when Wilma came through here, and I put up wood on the windows and everything, and I went and got a, a couple large pizzas from the pizzeria down the street, and they were like, what's that for? And I'm like, pizza the last three, four, five days without going bad. I'm like, y- you know... <laughs> I'm like, you can't do that with meat or anything else. And they were like, well, we're, I don't think we're going to need it. It's not going to be that bad. After the storm came through, they were like, wow, dude, can we come by your place? Because some of their places, the, their windows were, you know, blown open or some of them didn't have any power or food, you know, nothing. Everybody was like, we don't have any food. We didn't prepare. We don't have any candles. We don't have anything. And they were all busting my balls beforehand. But afterwards, everybody wanted to come hang out with me. That's you know, right. Popeye, can we come over and hang out, dude? Because we, we don't have anything. And I was like, you can come over, but I ain't giving you my food. I mean, the food that I we I gave out was the and, and we used up, uh, you know, uh, with the, with everybody was the stuff that was going to go bad in the refrigerators. But anything that could keep, I didn't give that out. I kept that because that had to sustain me once we got past that. And within, right. you know, after a hurricane comes by, within the first five, six hours of the storm having passed... They they rape the food stores and stuff. There's no there's no coal. There's no little grills. There's none of that crap. They come and take everything. So if the power goes out, if there's a massive snowstorm, doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter if you have to worry about hurricanes or not. What about earthquakes? What about tornadoes? What about you know? Don't worry about just the new world order. Worry about natural disasters too, because they happen as well. Be prepared. We're going to break, ladies and gentlemen. We will be right. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. We were talking about throwing out your cell phones. We were talking about getting back to a simpler way of life. Sustainable living. Growing your own food. Even if you live in an apartment. You heard Natasha tell you exactly how you could get around that and perhaps grow your own food. At least try. Start. Maybe even have some quail, small birds. You know, tell them, yeah, they're my pet birds. They don't know what you're doing with them as long as they don't see you. You know, it, the best thing I can tell you if you're going to do that and it's in an apartment complex, you just uh, if you're going to keep them out on the balcony, you, you know, you, it's easier to have a, an apartment up higher up because the higher floors, it's harder for them to see from the ground, and it would hard for them to be tell you know tell what kind of you know bird it is, and then you could bring them in the house if you had to in the apartment. There are certain ways to get around it. Obviously, everybody. Everybody's case, each each and every one is kind of a case by case basis, but it can be done. Rabbits you know, are good too. Is it what you know? It, it, I know people eat rabbit, but what else besides eating it can the rabbit do? Like, is it a multifunctional animal like the goat? If you have like lawn or pasture, then I guess it would be multifunctional. You could use the, you know, the droppings for fertilizer as well. But if you're on a balcony, I'd say you, you just meet pretty much. Well, you could use the litter from the balcony, and then if you have a garden, something in your balcony, you could use that, the compost from the rabbit. We had rabbits a as pets I had pet rabbits when I was a yeah. kid. We had rabbit coops in my backyard. Oh, my God, but, but they breed like crazy. I mean, I think I read oh, something yeah. 
Okay, a pair of rabbits can literally in a year produce 600 pounds of meat. Mm-hmm. So, Get that go. around your head. Those two <laughs> little rabbits. Start with two and you. That's all you need. That's and, how much they, you know. Oh, that's where the stuff. expression <laughs> screwing like rabbits comes from. That's mm-hmm. right. <laughs> and you can stack them, too, in cages, you know, fit them pretty good. And you can sell the extra ones for money. Yeah, exactly. And pet stores will need them. You, you know, can they, sell them on Craigslist. Depending on which ones you get, they go for pretty good thirty dollars a piece. Some of them, so some of them go forty, forty-five, fifty, depending on the breeds. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, according to uh, one of the uh, chatters, brought it up in the chat room. He said, "Popeye growing food is against the law." Of course it is. That's why they don't want you to be able to grow your own food because they're afraid of that. They want you to have to buy their GMO big pharma crap that they produce. That's you right. Know, they want you to buy Monsanto's Terminator seeds. They want you to buy uh, you know, GMO fish. They want you to buy spider goat and eat spider goat. They don't want you to have a regular goat. They want you to have spider goat. So now you can't drink the milk, but hey, you could make Kevlar out of it, so... Well, yeah. imagine if you had like, you know, 30 rabbits or something or like quail and, you know, things go under and, you know, somebody needs something, you can barter with a, a couple rabbits and you can get something else that you need, some milk or, you know, eggs or bread or I whatever. have talents you know? that you I know. You can't eat your gold coin at that point, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. I have, <laughs> well, I have <laughs> That's trades. what I think about. <laughs> I have trades. Trades are a good thing to know. I think everybody should alert, learn at least one trade. I have multiple trades under my belt. Definitely. And I, I suggest you use them, you know, because not only do they can you help can they help you that way with bartering and stuff, but hey, like when things go wrong at my place, I don't even buy so they, I mean I, I I'm kind of stuck up about this, I guess. I pay uh, my rent and it includes maintenance, so you know, I make them, you know, if I'm paying for it, uh-uh, you're going to do it. But their maintenance program where I live sucks so bad that I end up fixing the stuff myself usually. And most of the apartments in Miami are like that. You know, Natasha, how Miami is. You know, a lot of times the landlords are dirtbags, so you have no choice but to fix stuff yourself. I mean, I lived in one place. My whole closet collapsed. It was with those crappy wire shelves. And one side collapsed because they were all connected. As soon as one side went, it just the whole thing went around like dominoes right around the, the inside of the closet. And it was a walk-in closet, and it literally ripped them right out of the walls. So now I had these huge holes in the sheetrock and everything else. Day and a half later, I had a brand-new closet built with wooden shelves and uh, dowel rods for, for, curtain hang- uh, to, for curtains, uh, for uh, hangers to hang your, your stuff on, you know, uh, not, not some crappy wire shelves. It was all old-school wooden shells and, and dowels and everything. And that's the way it should be. Okay? And I built a nice strong closet. Day and a half I was able to fix the whole thing. I went and got all the supplies, you know, cut the wood over at Home Depot, had them cut it for me, gave them the measurements and everything I needed. You know, did what I had to do. And I had it done. And I'm a disabled vet. So if I could do it, there's no excuse why some somebody else can't do it. There's no reason why you can't go learn carpentry, basic carpentry. Go learn how to measure a piece of friggin' wood. I mean, go. I, I, I've said this before on my other shows. I think it's appalling that more women know how to change tires than men. Wow, really? It's, it's off. It's very sad. When I worked for AAA, oh, that is sad. <laughs> there was more chicks that would be trying to change their tire on the side of the road than men. And there are more women that know how to change tires than men. And that's mainly because a lot of these chicks, they had fathers who... When they got their license, they made them learn how to change a tire. Uh, and even yeah. they didn't learn, teach them, they, they taught them how to check the oil and change a tire. That was like the basics. That's <laughs> so what, screw the boys? <laughs> <laughs> Most boys, a lot of boys, you know, uh, sometimes their parents teach them, but uh, parents, I think, used to, back in the day, they took for granted. There used to be auto shop in high school, you know, and wood shop and stuff. So a lot of this basic no carpentry America. stuff was taught. Yep. Not anymore. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> You know, all that all that good stuff is was taken out, you know, and, and then they left math and social studies and all the other stuff. And now that's not even taught. Now they just teach them whatever they have to the past these no child left behind tests. And then the kids graduate high school and literally they can't even add. I mean, it's it's and that's not an exaggeration. A friend of my mother-in-law's is a teacher. 
She's been teaching for over 30 years. She's quitting this year. She's retiring because she's tired. She says, you know, from when I started till now, these, these children are so stupid. She's like, these kids are graduating and they literally don't know what five plus five is. You know, they don't know basic history because they're not being taught this stuff anymore. They're just being taught what they need to know to pass these tests. Exactly. So, and I wonder if, so, but, I remember when I was in middle school, they had wood shop. I wonder if they still have that anymore. No, it's all gone, dude. They removed all of it. I had wood shop. I had metal shop. We had auto shop. It's all gone. They took that out. Then they started removing the arts programs like art and music. Anything that anything that gets your, you know, both sides of your brain going, okay? Uh, anything that gets even just the left side of your brain going, you know, the the non reptilian side of your brain. Yeah. <laughs> they literally they they banned all that. And then they give you the only thing that's left is um uh you, you know the only thing they leave you is like basic science and math and stuff. And well, Bob Tuscan said in the chat room that they still have the the Photoshop classes. I didn't know that. I figured by now they would have taken that out too because that would teach attention to detail. And I'm sure they don't want that. You know, so I'm surprised that uh, you know. Thank you to Bob for pointing that out. I I'm surprised that they they actually still have the photo classes, but they took out the the metal class. They I mean, we had metal shop. We learned. I made crowbars. I still have my crowbar that I made in metal shop. It was oh, just yeah. like twenty something years ago, dude. And I could this thing. I, you could take doors off of hinges with it. You know, not anymore. They don't teach metal shop, wood shop. My my mother, when she um, died back in uh, the end of 2003, we cleaned her house out. She still had magazine racks that my brother and I had built in wood shop. You know? It cracked me up. I was like, wow, I built this thing like you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, and here it is. I'm looking at this thing like, wow. You know, like, holy crap. It was it was very weird for me. It was, it, to know what they've done to the educational system is sickening. Uh... It's very sad. Kids aren't taught anything anymore. Like I said the other night, kids can't even change, men can't change tires. Women are taught because their fathers at least had some brains in their head. Go on the break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. If you hear any barking or growling in the background, that is my little guard dog monster here. She's being rather loud. Normally, she's a good girl while I'm on air, but she's being rather loud suddenly. So if you hear any barking or grunting in the background, though, that's not me. And no, I'm not doing any weird experiments in the background. That's just my... My little munchkin running around. All right. So I have a question. If someone doesn't have a lot of money and they live in the city but they want to move out to the country, how would you, either one of you, recommend that they go about starting this? Because I know that's going to be a question asked. How do we start this? Where do, how do we take that first step? Because that first step is probably the biggest one. You know, and then everything else kind of just starts to follow, you know, and fall into place. How do you go about taking that first step? Well, if your first step is getting out of the city and into the country, I'd start looking places like Craigslist and other kind of places where you can find good deals on land, owner financing, like we were talking about. Because there's lots of people who are willing to work with you, <clears throat> give you a good interest rate, and, a, you know, for. A reasonable down payment too so just to start doing your research that way you know making make a plan have a, a kind of an outline I guess of what you want to do you could also post an ad on Craigslist and maybe the areas that you want to move to where it seems that uh, has properties that are available that might be in your price range you could post an ad and say hey I'm looking for a a fixer-upper in this price range, um, looking for owner financing, please contact me. And that's what it's called, help. owner financing. So that's what they should yeah. they, they should somehow mm -hmm. try to find owner financing, it's called, correct? Yes. Yeah. And okay. it'd be nice if you could get somebody that'll give you owner financing who has a house that's paid off. 
because then you don't have to worry about the bank coming and taking the house away from them, them and then taking it away from you. There might be something legally you can prevent from that from happening. I'm not sure, but it, it would be good that the person would have the house paid off. It would be good, I would say. Well, yeah, because you don't want to have the deal with foreclosures and the bank and stuff like that. And there's a lot of people yeah. that do have their properties paid off. So. Oh, yeah. A lot of people in the country, a lot of um, older people that, you know... It's inherited land. Yeah, people that don't want to inherit the land, people who have gone off and are now living in the city, don't want to take care of, you know, grandma, grandpa's property, you know, and they just sell it and it's paid off. And, and it's because it's such a horrible real estate market right now. They're willing oh, yeah. to not deal with the banks. They're willing to do the owner financing because... They'd rather say screw the banks, which is awesome because if you can just cut the bank out, there you go. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just looked at a place that had a, a trailer home that was a pretty uh, decent size. It was small, would be good for about two or three people, maybe two people with a child. And um, it had wood floors and it had about 10 acres and it was only $25,000 and the person would be willing to do owner financing. And probably with not a whole lot down. And I'm pretty sure that house was paid off. So I would hook up with a realtor maybe in the area where you want to live and tell them your price area, price range, and uh, give them your contact information. If they don't have anything, they can contact you if something does come up. If, if you have a cousin or a brother maybe that knows about carpentry that can help you out to do some of the repairs, if you might be able to find a house that's in good shape uh, for a reasonable price with the economy the way it is. Or maybe you could just buy a piece of land and build your own structure. You can make houses out of uh, Connex boxes, you know, the the ones they use, they, they put on uh, trains where they carry uh, maybe gravel or food or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? The big metal boxes, the Connexes? Mm-hmm. I know what you're talking about. The storage containers? Well, anyways, there have been people that have been using uh, those as building materials, and you can save, like, a lot on your building costs when you use those. And you can yeah. get them used, or you can get them new. I and, agree. Uh, you could, you you could, could get start building it that little by little. It does help you save money and build some some sustainable structures. That's pretty cool. What have you seen? Like, what um, what's some of the stuff that you've seen being used other than storage uh, containers and stuff like that? Um, they have what they're called yurts. They're, they're these dome structures. They look like um, almost like this geometric kind of pattern, and it's like a dome. And they have those. Uh, you could even, I mean, you could even put a big tent if you really wanted to rough it and, you know, find a way, put in a septic system so at least you have an outhouse or maybe just build an outhouse and... I mean, just dig a hole. Yeah, just dig a hole. I mean, the house that we just bought, like the generation before us, they just had an outhouse. I mean, and they just went. Or you can get a composting toilet. You can get those for a pretty reasonable price, and um, set up pretty low. I mean, it depends on how low you want to go. I mean, you can do it if you really want to, and you want to rough it for a while. You can do it. It's just yeah, you'll you'll a find a way to make it happen. Yeah, and just, you know, work little by little at eliminating your debt. That is the main thing I would say. Little by little, start chunking away at your debt. Have a plan. Make a make a one-year plan and a five-year plan. During your one-year plan, start doing your ba balcony garden. Start storing food. Start looking in areas where you want to live. Start eliminating your debt. Yeah. Little by little, start looking for ways that you can make money on your own. So if you're going to be living out in the country, you can kind of find a way that you can make money without having to rely on a nine to five job. You know, whether it's making something, crafts, um, you know, you cut hair, you uh, want to open your own shop. I mean, that goes back to the whole trade. You know, and yeah. if you live out into the, if you live out in the country, you could always, you know, put up a, if you have a, a space, if you have a, you could always put up a, if, or if you have a shed or whatever, you could eventually make something that you could have a little shop or whatever on the side that you, you know, you, you just, that's where you have people come and if they need to come see you, they can mail you stuff or come visit you or whatever. And I mean, there is ways to get around it. 
But they're right. they're trying very rapidly to close all that off. And they're first, what they have to do is they have to make everybody believe that that's abnormal and that that kind of behavior is strange and only terrorists do that. And yeah. once they marginalize everybody, then they can round people up. But first, they got to marginalize everybody and, and make make the the general public the the sheep think that anybody that can sustain themselves and doesn't need the electric company or doesn't need to go to win Dixie or Publix, you know, every couple of days to get food, uh, you know, that, oh, they must be weird because they can take care of themselves. That's odd. Right. I need a, you know, sure. I need a nanny. And that's <laughs> why they demonize people like that. You know, that's why it's important that, you know, people hear how easy it is to do it so that they go and take that step and more sure. people do it. You know, people like it's, exactly. People like that because they're free thinkers. They might actually grow a chicken or, or raise chickens rather or, or you know, grow plants or grow their own food, and God forbid they don't buy Terminator seeds, or God forbid they, they actually you know, know how to grow their own food. Oh my God, the cattle know how to take care of themselves. Oh, what do we do? You know, that's that's basically how they look at it. They're they're really afraid of people coming into their own and and waking up and realizing and 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 coming out of this trance, you know. This Walking Dead type trance that they're in, and, and they don't want that. No, they, they don't. Really don't want that. No, I, I don't. You can see they don't. Let me ask you guys this, because we got a couple minutes before we go into break, and then we come back. We have one segment left. Um, in fact, I, I, I'll aim it at Boris. As a guy, do you see how they've they've taken the men that or, or the man out of men? You know what I'm saying? Yes. They've, they, they've made men, you know, it's not okay if you know how to chop wood or build a fire. That's strange. You know, that's, that's, that's weird, crazy wood people type thing that do that. You know, like basic stuff that you should know to be a man and being a man. You know, have you noticed that they've attacked that? That's, that's disappearing faster and faster. It's, it's becoming, you know, you can see it on TV and the movies and stuff. They dress men up in women's clothes all the time now. That's a, Yeah, that's every a, movie there's a guy dressed up in, in a women's dress as a guy. Yeah. You notice that? Yeah, they're, they're, they're taking, sissifying America like somebody wrote in the chat room earlier. So. Hey, well, how I, is it in I, the country I, by you? Do you notice that people still, you know, men know how to change tires and go hunting and oh, stuff yeah. like that to, and protect their family conspiracy theories so that that's good at least September there's still the people in the country that know lies that attempt to ladies and gentlemen we're going to break we will be right back away from the guilty f you george w bush you are a war criminal yo gemini what's your you will sling one day battery will get unplugged as I continue to blame the night sky blowing the hawk for towers The it go railways happen. in New York lost their towers we'll be right back. Don't sit back or hesitate to react to the impact Many taking a nap, in fact, they would fake an attack To make way for the pain We're back, ladies and gentlemen, for the final segment. As I was telling Natasha before we went on air, she said, I don't know if I'm going to have enough to talk about for two hours. <laughs> I said, Dory, you know, I hear that every time someone comes on. I know. And, uh, and, it, it, I, and, and she was worried that it was going to go be really long, and it just flew right by. It always, that's the way it always works. You know, you, you, you get something interesting, you talk about something interesting, you blink, and the next thing you know, the show's over. Um, I, we don't, we got about 10 minutes, so I, I want to get, uh, <clears throat> your take on the local area there. Cause you guys got cut off. Uh, what's the local area like? Are they somewhat awake to what's going on? Does anybody think that, you know, do they still buy the 19 Muslims from the cave, you know, in Afghanistan with a laptop thing? Do you, uh, are people starting to wake up and see what's up with the New World Order? What, what What's going on? Um, we, as far as people's politics go, we haven't really delved into that. It's people are uh, like the guy behind us, his father owned the land, and he, he lives like right to the back of us he was in the military and everything and he's i think he's 
kind of aware a little bit of what's going on. So he he builds guns and stuff. It's it's pretty cool. So so he's into the nice Second Amendment. Yeah. Well, but he, does he know about the Constitution? I guess I mean, like, do these do, do they understand their rights at least somewhat around there? Do they? Is it still? Do they still practice their freedom around where you guys live? Do they still? You know, do people play with their guns like they should? Do uh, are men still men, or or has it gotten? Has it reached its evil tentacles into the? You know, that far into the countryside. I think it's trying to. Uh, since we've lived here, I think they've got four new cops. So that's, there used to be, I think, four or five, and now there's eight or nine. So that's a big jump for here. I know it sounds funny somewhere else, but. No, that's like, that's like a 40, almost 50% rise in the police force. Exactly. So, you know, it's, but, you know, as far as the new cops, I don't really know much about. My mom owns a barbershop in town, so she kind of gets the gist on what's going on. But, uh. Men pretty much raise their children the way they're supposed to, you know. Their boys, you know, they do it right. They teach their they they teach their their boys to be men, and the men act like men. That's good, and everybody practices their their at least some of their constitutional rights. Uh, I, I would assume it's probably more of a conservative area than a. Uh, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, than a liberal area, but. Uh, but- but the thing is that women, as far as homesteads are concerned and farms especially, women did just as much hunting. Women did just as much uh, of the things that men did. Uh, my One of my friends, when she was growing up, she her, her parents, they rarely actually saw money. They bartered. Um, they bought in occasionally flour. And her her mother could hunt and kill a buck and skin it and cut it up and cook it and eat it. I mean, she knew how to do everything, and that's how people were. People, some people still are. Um, you can all your food, um, keep it in the basement. You eat seasonal vegetables. You have a greenhouse, um, and and it's more of a community. If somebody comes over. Um, let's say your uncle comes over, well, they know that they're going to be partaking in whatever your family's doing at the time, whether it's baking or, you know, taking care of the goats or building a fence or whatever. They'll grab a hammer and start building the fence with you and be like, hey, what's up? You know, oh, yeah, we're building this fence. And then maybe later on you'll go over to their house and help them out with something. It's just like a real sense of community and everybody kind of does their share. That's, that's how we're going to defeat the so like, order. Huh? That's how we're going to win. That's exactly how we're going to win. Doing what you and your husband are doing. Exactly what you guys are doing. That's how we're going to win. You guys are grassroots yeah. networking. You're building cohesive, strong relationships with your neighbors and your community. And that's the way it should be. And see, that's what they don't want. That's why they push this this urban living where nobody likes to... Because in the cities, you know, nobody wants to get to know each other. Everybody's, everybody's sketchy. Nobody oh, wants to know one another. They avoid each other like the plague, right? Well, everybody's yeah. in a hurry. Everybody's got to get somewhere. Everybody's got to do something. Everybody's, you know, you're running out of time. You don't have enough time in the city. You live in the yeah, country. Yeah, that, that too. I, I, you know, damn it, I don't have enough time. time. I There's more time. time. I know it's exactly just, what you mean. <laughs> things slow down out here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you still have a lot of things to do. You wake up, you know, early and you're doing stuff all day, but it's it's just different. You enjoy what you're doing, not you're not dreading it. Yeah, you love it. Uh, that that's the that's I think that's that's one of the ways we're going to cure this cancer, is uh, mm-hmm. homeopathic treatment like that, like moving out to the countryside and getting back in touch with nature and recharging your spiritual energy. There's there we have to do this because uh, at a ba- at, there's so many levels that they're dehumanizing us on. And, you know, they're getting to eat processed foods and take vaccines and not care about your neighbor and not worry about anybody, not want to talk yeah. to your neighbor. You know, and I, I think living like you guys are living is the exact antithesis to what the New World Order wants. And that's why I wanted to bring you guys on the show. 
I wanted people to be able to hear that it is completely possible to go from the city to the countryside, and it doesn't take this vast, you know, leap of oh my God, are we going to make it? You know, you you can do it. It's not as hard as you think, mm -hmm. and it it it's much easier than you really think it is, and uh, you know. People, I think that's the biggest thing. It, the big, one of the biggest things that stops people is they build it up in their mind, just like anything else. You know, they build that that doubt about it up. Can I do it? Is it going to be hard? Blah 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 blah. And they build up all these mental blocks, and there's no need for it. You know, no. and I, you guys are living proof that it's really easy. And I commend you guys for doing what you're doing. I think it's awesome. You know, well, it kind of sucks. A great time doing it. It, it kind of sucks that you don't really have like super high speed internet, but you got to make sacrifices, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's it's okay. You guys, I'm sure you guys could uh, adjust, but I really think it's it's something that people need to think about. And if you can't, it, like, I don't expect people to just you know tomorrow pack their stuff, quit their job, move out to the country, and be like, "Well, you told me to, Popeye." <laughs> <laughs> Do your research hey, first. Research, yeah, lots of research. Exactly. Well, how much you guys spent months, obviously, checking things out before you went out there, correct? Yeah, I, I mean, I've spent. We've spent years, a, pretty yeah, much, probably years dreaming about it, and then planning and. Mm hmm. I mean, a lot of people. You talk to a lot of people. Oh, you have a farm. I've always wanted to do that. That's a dream. That's really nice, but they don't. They can't conceptualize follow it, through and, with that. and follow through with it. It's just kind of like. It's kind of this dream that, you know, and then by the time you get old and you die and, you know, you just never you do never it. Get it done. Well, that's why I commend you guys because you actually uh, physically manifested something that you dreamt about doing and having. And I think that is commendable and one of the most awesome things anybody could do. And again, I want you guys to be an example of what can be done uh, with, uh, you know, you know a deep, some effort, but... You don't have to spend a bazillion dollars to do it. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it, you know, you don't have to, I guess you do have to kind of change your life, but you don't have to radically, you know, give everything up that you believe in or that you do or anything to go out and just live in the countryside and be free. <sighs> you know, be able to, <sighs> you know, get away from the city and get away from all that tension and that stress that's constantly pushed into the body and again that dehumanizes you because you're so you're so around people all the time that you just get sick of them and you're like god shut up i don't want to talk to you yeah Whereas, exactly you know getting out in the country you're like hey you know tim i haven't seen you in, in three days wave how are you mm -hmm. everybody waves <laughs> everybody says hi it's nice I think that's awesome. You know, we need to get back to that. That's how we're going to that's one of the ways we're going to defeat this is getting our humanity back. Because that's that's what makes people start to care about, you know, getting involved or, or getting angry. You have to get, have humanity first. And they've robbed that from so many people that people, you mm. know, they see someone getting stabbed in the street, they don't care. You know, whatever, I don't want to yeah. get involved, you know. Exactly. I, I don't want to get involved, you know, I could get sued or and that's why we have to have tort reform. There's a lot of things we do need. We got to get rid of these, these BS lawyers. We got to make you know BS lawsuits. You know should be illegal because they they clog up the system, and then you have problems like that. People don't want to get involved anymore because they don't want to get sued, and they start to, again. They they allow this this litigious society to help get rid of their humanity. You know, if you see someone dying or bleeding in the street, try to help them out. Do what you can do. Don't just walk over the guy and continue on about your, your, your day. That's a scumbag maneuver, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing on a grassroots level. Build a, a relationship with your neighbor. You never well, know. That's, that's what they want. They want people to file frivolous lawsuits against each other and hate each other and just, you know, not be able to resolve issues one-to-one, uh, -one, you know, neighbor-to-neighbor. -neighbor. You know, you have to call the cops. You can't just go talk to each other and work things out. I mean, my neighbor, when I was when we were shooting, she came over just to kind of check on us and see which direction we were shooting to make sure we weren't shooting towards her property, you know, and, and we were like, but hey, what's up? We gave her some eggs. She was you like, see, hey. you, you get to meet your neighbors. You build a little uh, a little rapport with them. That's good. Boris, Natasha, guys, we're out of time. Let me know when your book comes out and I will uh, have you guys back on to talk about the book and everything. 
but I hope the listeners enjoyed the show. Guys, thanks for listening. I'll be back Wednesday and tomorrow. Don't forget WTF 1012.